This is America on the Road, winner of the International Automotive Media Conference Gold Medal Award for Radio, and now in its 24th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. America on the Road is brought to you by DrivingToday.com and the Coalition for Vehicle Choice. I'm Jack Nerad. With me is Chris Teague. Chris is based on the East Coast in Maine. And uh, Chris, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, what you do. I think that's helpful for people to understand. Absolutely. I am actually not from Maine. I'm from Tennessee originally and kind of traveled all over the place before having the opportunity to move up here about 10 years ago, uh, right before the start of winter, which I would heartily advise anyone against doing if you haven't spent time in in northern climates. It's quite a shock. but I've been married to my wife for uh, almost eight years now, or just over eight years, I should say. And uh, we have two wonderful kids, an almost four-year-old and an almost seven-year-old, almost eight-year-old. Geez, I'm bad with numbers today. Uh, but, uh, you know, we get along. My wife is uh, an assistant principal here in the state at one of the local school districts. And I write about the automotive industry and a few others, but spend most of my time writing for uh, sites like The Drive and Ford Authority and driving today uh, and a little bit of everything, but I do test uh, new vehicles every week uh, as well as write news and study market trends. So yeah, kind of the quick dirty about me. Well, it's great stuff. And I, on the other hand, am based on the West Coast in Southern California, Los Angeles area. Uh, South Bay is what we call it here. And uh, I've been doing this for a long time now, 30 years or so. I have grown children. Uh, and a wonderful wife who puts up with me and uh, lets me go into her office to uh, record show <laughs> every week uh, when we do it. So all of that stuff's terrific. And uh, as I say, I've been testing cars for a long, long time. I was editor of Motor Trend in the 80s, and I worked for J.D. Power in the 90s. And uh, then I worked for some car companies and then went to Kelly Blue Book for many, many years uh, as their editorial director. And now a freelance writer writing for Driving Today and Forbes.com, et cetera, et cetera. So... That's who we are on Driving Today. Um, In the road test segment today, we're going to be taking a look at the Volkswagen Tiguan, a small SUV. It's it's kind of a small SUV fest here uh, because we also have the Honda CR-V Hybrid. I think we tested or you tested um, the uh, conventional CR-V a few weeks ago, Chris, and uh, now you've got the hybrid version. Yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, and the funny thing is they're both the same color and spec, so uh, my neighbors were wondering why I had two vehicles pretty close to the same same spec right back to back, but yes, the hybrid. Yeah, you might want to look under the hood. Maybe they just changed the badge on you or something, and it might be the same vehicle. Uh, in our interview segment, we're going to be talking with Tim Kaniskas. He is global head of Alfa Romeo, but he is also the North American head of passenger cars for uh, Fiat Chrysler. And that's really what we're going to be talking to him about. And most specifically, Dodge. He is a performance guy, Uh, loves SRT, loves all the performance vehicles. And so we're going to talk about uh, all those at length with him. They had a bunch of new announcements uh, regarding performance early in July. And uh, we got to catch up with him uh, recently and speak with him for about 20 minutes or so. So I think you'll enjoy that interview. Uh, Before we do that, though, uh, we have news because we promise you the latest automotive information from around the world. What's your top news story, Chris? One that is near and dear to my heart, uh, written extensively about Mitsubishi over the years. But uh, one of their long running SUVs, people here probably remember it as the Montero from the early 2000s and back in years before that, which we stopped seeing it uh, quite a while ago. But uh, they're going to discontinue it globally next year. That's called the Pajero for global market. So that's the first part of the story. So that's a bummer for people who love rugged overlanding and SUVs and things like that. The bigger part of the story is that they're not going to c- continue introducing new vehicles in Europe and the UK, uh, which digs at a deeper problem for them, which is that they're in big financial trouble and they've got a, a big hole to come out of. Uh, so they're not going to introduce new models there. No word on what will happen in the United States or North America, but uh, if I had to guess, I would see a, I would guess a similar drawdown, if not completely, but just a few core models, um, so that they can focus on Southeast Asia, which is really their strong point. So, um, big deal if you're a big fan of Mitsubishi. Uh, probably not so much if you're buying uh, more mainstream cars here in the United States, but noteworthy nonetheless, given that Mitsubishi is part of the Nissan trifecta uh so 
uh, big news on that front. Yeah, and kind of big news all the way around because uh, Mitsubishi really had a big footprint in in Europe and much loved. Uh, they uh, competed in the Dakar Rally over and over and over again, and I think that helped gain them significant stature in Europe. Uh, and really well known for their uh, sport utility vehicles. They're, they're smaller sport utilities like the Montero or Pajero, I think is, uh, it was termed various places. And uh, so that's kind of a big change. And I'm really rooting for Mitsubishi to stick around here in North America. I have a, a personal rooting interest because uh, their head of PR is a, is a personal friend, uh, Jeremy Barnes. But at the same time, I think they have good products uh, and have had for a long time, and um, maybe uh, just underappreciated. I, I don't know if you feel the same way, Chris. I do, and I think they struggle with price versus value. So the prices that they have to charge to recoup their costs don't necessarily line up with what people assume a Mitsubishi should cost on the market. So I think that's one thing. But I think they have another kind of uh, a deep bucket now with the Renault and Nissan alliance, as they're calling it, because both of those companies have a deep bucket of uh, hybrid and electric and all sorts of uh, neat technologies that Mitsubishi can and probably will lean on uh, going forward. So I root for them. I hope they do well. I hope they get better and start to do well. Um, but this is not, not looking good right now. Yeah, and it is a shame. Well, in other news, uh, we are all concerned about social distancing right right now, mask wearing, all that stuff. I mean, we're, we're concerned about air quality, right? We're concerned about what is in the air we breathe. And uh, enclosed spaces can, can potentially be a problem. Uh, I think we've certainly proven that over the course of the, the last six, eight months, uh, depending on what's in the air. Well, Hyundai is trying to do something about that. Uh, maybe not necessarily limit disease, but certainly improve the uh, interior air quality in your vehicles because that interior air can have bacteria in it, of course, mold, odors. We've certainly experienced that. And particulates. And now it's come in all kinds of shapes and, and sizes. Well, not big sizes, but <laughs> they're, they're in your air. So they have introduced uh, some new technologies, one of which I think is fairly ingenious, and it is called the afterblow technology. That's the name of it. That's what they call it, the afterblow technology, uh, which might bring other things to mind, possibly. But um, it uses a dedicated fan to dry water that has condensed on your air conditioning evaporator, which, unbeknownst to you, or maybe beknownst to you, uh, can be a problem uh, because mold can grow in there. What, what happens is you, you turn off the car, Water collects on the evaporator on the outside, it condenses, and then mold grows. And then it stinks the next time you you turn the air conditioner on. And you wonder what you can do about that pretty rank smell. And there's not a whole lot. Uh, the best thing you can do is pre prevent it from happening in the first place uh, because it takes some rather uh, onerous cleaning uh, to, to fix it otherwise. Uh, so that's one of the uh, technologies they have, and I, like I say, fairly ingenious. I think we're going to see that from other manufacturers. Then they have what they call a fine dust indicator. Now, I'm not uh, one who thinks there's a ton of dust in the, <laughs> the cars I typically drive, uh, but there can be particulates in there, and they can be uh, rather high levels depending on where you live and what's happening outside the car and what the, the car is sucking into its interior. So this indicates um, what your, actually measures the air inside and uh, figures out uh, the particulate level. And if it's a bad particulate level, according to the machine, it turns itself on and says, hey, <laughs> we're going to clean this out. And it keeps cleaning until it reaches a level that it feels more comfortable. So all of this, if you just have the system turned on, uh, happens automatically. And so you have automatically cleaner air to breathe inside your car, which is a lovely thing. I think that is a wonderful thing. In fact, I wish that my wife's Subaru had had the uh, afterblow technology. Uh, in a recent issue, we had a milk jug explode in the car, and the smell Ooh. the smell has lingered despite our better efforts in cleaning as well as a professional cleaning. So not that a filter would do much to, to clean that, but I think <laughs> anything you could, can add to a situation to improve the odor and the, the quality of the air you're breathing is, is good news. Yeah, absolutely true. And I think you have another piece of news for us, don't, too, don't you? 
I do. It's just it's a quick hit. So uh, IHS Market uh, released a recent study. They're finding that the average age of cars and trucks on the roads in the United States has risen to 11.9 years, which is a month older than in 2019. And that might not sound like a whole lot, but that averaged up does mean that cars are getting older on the road for a bunch of reasons. Um, a, f- a few related to COVID-19. So people aren't going out shopping as much for new vehicles. They're driving the ones they have for longer but it's also kind of economic uh, uncertainty. So it's a somewhat of an indicator of people's confidence in how things will, will pan out financially and economically for them. And then also uh, the fact that new vehicles are becoming more expensive and people are just unwilling to or unable to pay some of the prices. So um, it's a good indicator on a few fronts, but it's also an interesting kind of storytelling mechanism for what's going on in the greater economy right now. Yeah, really true. And what it indicates too is that... Uh Car years are a lot like dog years, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I guess if the average age of a car is around 11 and you multiply that by 7, that's, if I'm doing it right, 77, and uh, then you've got kind of aged cars out there. Yeah, and we uh, could also take it as a good thing. Cars are lasting longer. Cars are built better than they were years ago. But I don't think there's any doubt of that. That's <laughs> absolutely a fact, that cars are better built, probably better built than ever before. And uh, I think we're seeing that every day in what we test. So we're lucky to do that. Absolutely. Which uh, kind of segues to our next segment, which is uh, all about road testing. Uh, We're going to be road testing the Volkswagen Tiguan and the uh, Honda CR-V Hybrid. So stay with us for that. We'll be right back with Chris Teague. I'm Jack Nerad, and uh, this is America on the Road. Thanks for being with us. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack Red with you, along with Chris Teague, and uh, we're so pleased to have him with us as co-host. Chris, you were, it is road test time. I should mention that, and uh, I should also mention what you're about to road test, which is the uh, Honda CR-V Hybrid. Really well-known vehicle, but not so much in hybrid form. Tell us all about it. Yes, the hybrid is relatively new, uh, and as you mentioned earlier, we I tested the, the regular, quote-unquote, CR-V just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this one uh, is interesting. It's the first Honda hybrid to have all-wheel drive. Um, it's quite refined. There's there's not a lot of uh, awkwardness in the handoff between hybrid system and gas engine. So if you've ever driven a hybrid car, you know, there's sometimes a little bit of uh, jittering or stuttering when you're going slow and then you go a little bit faster and the gas engine actually kicks in. So um, it's a very, very smooth handoff. I was impressed by that. Uh, It's got 212 horsepower, which is about 22 more than the standard gas turbocharged engine produces. Uh, And you feel it. There's instant torque from the uh, from the electric motors. As I mentioned, it's just a really refined and smooth acceleration. Uh, I tested the touring trim, which is uh, the top trim. So uh, we had leather seats. We had Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, uh, power moonroof. And uh, just like a normal CRV, the back seat is roomy for kids. Uh, the cargo space is one of the best in the segment. I believe it's, uh, if not the top, it's one of the top two or three. And uh, I think they look good. Honda's done a good job with their latest uh, version of the CRV. The interior materials are wonderful. Even though the, the wood trim is fake and it's very visually fake, it, everything feels solid. The doors close with a, a nice thud. And uh, the kids really enjoy the sound that the, the vehicle makes when you're driving slowly with the hybrid system only on battery. It makes kind of a spaceship noise. I won't try to embarrass myself by making it here, but it's very... Ah, go ahead. (laughs) It sounds like a mix between a quiet vacuum cleaner and a microwave, um, kind of. But uh, it's really interesting. My neighbor's got a kick out of it. Uh, It's very loud. You can hear it inside homes and things. So uh, that's a good way to make sure you know that the vehicle's coming. Otherwise, it would be silent for other than the tire noise on the road. but I think they did. So this yeah. is a noise it's mit- emitting intentionally to let you know that it's around as opposed to engine noise or mechanical noise. Exactly. But it's every bit the UFO sound from, you know, the mid 80s and 90s sci fi movies that we all loved and we'll probably remember some of us at least. Um, very, very sci fi. It's, it's unique. And it, the first couple of times you hear it, it kind of catches you off guard. Um, but I think Honda did a good job with the, their first hybrid for the, the CRV. It's not the most efficient in the segment, but I do think it's one of the more refined um, and more upscale feeling offerings, especially in the higher trims. Yeah, it's interesting that they are going to a hybrid kind of late in the game with the CRV. uh, And I think what they're seeing 
is uh, Toyota, the arch rival, is doing very well with the, uh, the RAV4 hybrid, a, a vehicle I certainly like. I think you do, too. Uh, and it, it makes sense that uh, they would have a competitor. They have not been, they being Honda, has not been nearly as gung-ho about hybrid technology as Toyota has. I think they do it uh, reluctantly. <laughs> That's the sense I get. Mm -hmm. uh, Honda engineers realize uh, that uh, maybe hybrids aren't the most efficient way to uh, build a car. They might be an efficient way to get high fuel economy, <laughs> but they, they're kind of expensive to build, and they look at other things. But um, it sounds like they've really put together a, a good piece here. I think so. They did. A, they've done a good job with smaller engines with turbochargers. You know, building more efficiency in that way. But as we talked a couple of weeks ago about the standard CRV, um, it's not quick. It's not very sporty, but it is comfortable. But I think they've actually kind of coinc or not coincidentally, but accidentally built uh, the performance CRV with the hybrid because it does feel torquier. It does feel quicker off the line, um, and it does feel you know more willing to to get up and go in general. But um, still not a sports, uh, sporty sport utility by any means, but they've done a good job bolting it together. Right. Well, I was driving what might be termed a uh, sporty sport utility, and that's the Volkswagen Tiguan. Uh, interestingly, though, it can seat either five or seven. Uh, seven is more than the CRV is ever going to handle. And uh, so you would not necessarily think a vehicle that was large enough to do that would be particularly sporty. Uh, and yet I found it to be so. Uh, so there's either something wrong with me or something really right about the Volkswagen Tiguan. Um, and maybe you could argue both. Uh, it's powered by a 184 horsepower turbocharged two liter four cylinder engine, has an eight speed automatic transmission. And I like the fact that it has eight actual speeds. It is not a CVT. I'm not the, the person who absolutely detests CVTs the way some enthusiasts do. Uh, but uh, I do like a, a nice conventional geared transmission. And uh, front or all-wheel drive versions are available uh, in the Tiguan, as you might expect. We had a, a four-wheel drive version in our driveway. Um, and I've got to say, uh, it, it was fun to drive. 184 horsepower doesn't seem like a lot when put up against um, a seven-passenger vehicle, but it seemed very sprightly. Uh, I wouldn't say fast, but uh, peppy. And um, there's just a lot to like about the handling of this vehicle. I think there's a, if there is such a thing as European handling, and I really think there is, uh, this has it. And um, it's a little more precise, not quite as ride quality oriented as uh, the Japanese vehicles are, perhaps. And uh, I like that. Uh, and it's filled with um, safety stuff. Forward collision warning with pedestrian detection, automatic emergency braking, blind spot warning, all that stuff. So I enjoyed that, although I didn't have to use it. So I guess I enjoyed having the peace of mind of having it without really testing it. Those are, I don't think you really want to test the pedestrian warning system so much because <laughs> um, like, it could be a little tough on the pedestrian, especially <laughs> if it's not working out all that well or the automatic emergency braking for that matter. Uh, I did test that pulling up against it, a garage door as we were uh, parking at some neighbor's house the other day, and uh, it worked just fine. I didn't crash into the garage door, which was a great thing for all concerned. So I enjoyed that. Um, I, I mentioned it's a seven-passenger uh, vehicle. The, the two final people <laughs> in it have to be pretty small to fit in the back seat, but uh, it can be done, and that uh, separates it from so many of the compact SUVs out there. So... All around, uh, there's just a lot to like. I mean, I, I can remember when Volkswagen, kicking and screaming, did not want to do SUVs at all. And they really suffered in the American market for that uh, failure to do so. And they've changed their tune pretty big time. And now um, this is a very comfortable vehicle with a, just a spectacular interior. I think it's just really well-tailored interior and a good infotainment system and just a, an all-around uh, nice piece. I agree. I actually owned the previous generation Tiguan uh, several years ago, and it struggled to fit four people, much less five or seven. So I like the direction they've gone uh, with, them, with kind of bumping the size up a little bit, although we, a lot of us bemoan more SUVs on the road. I think they took the right approach with this. And you're right, the back seat, the way back, as my kids would call it, it should be reserved for 
kids or very short drives for adults, but it's a nice option, nice ability to have that back there. Uh, as you mentioned, the infotainment VW makes one of the better systems in the industry. It's very intuitive and it's quick. It's it's snappy um, and it's easy to use. So uh, I think all around they've they've done a good job with it. And uh, yeah, definitely not sporty as you say, but it is. It does have kind of fun handling and and does its job well. So uh, good job for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's certainly one to look at. And I think both of the vehicles we're talking about, both the uh, Honda CRV uh, hybrid and the Volkswagen Tiguan uh, for the in this week's show are vehicles that uh, are among the best in their segment, uh, which is largely, I guess, the same segment. Uh, very different vehicles, uh, and yet uh, really provide great stuff for, for their buyers. Absolutely. So th- that is our review of those two vehicles. We are, when we come back, we will be um, taking listener questions. We'd love to hear your questions, so, and if you want to reach us, uh, just editor at drivingtoday.com. Editor at drivingtoday.com is where you would send your question, and then we'll answer it on an upcoming show. Um, ask us anything you'd like. Uh, if it's automotive, even better. Uh, but we'll take all kinds of questions and uh, try to answer them the best we can. We're uh, journalists and researchers, so we can come up with the answers to a lot of questions, even beyond uh, the automotive realm although I wouldn't trust us so much on those. But come back for that uh, with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nerad. This is America on the Road, and we're happy you're with us. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nerad back with you, and we are so glad you were with us on America on the Road. We really do appreciate it. It is question and answer time here. We're taking uh, listener questions and uh, providing uh, host answers to listener questions. And uh, we enjoy doing that. Uh, we work, work, work to gain information that we can convey to you uh, through America on the Road and through all the writing we do for the various websites and publications that we write for. So, Chris, I, th- I think uh, here's a question for you, and uh, I hope it's not too technical, but we'll see. Uh, a listener writes in and says, why are my headlights not as bright as I, as I believe they should be? What do you think is going on there? Well, it could be a few things, but thankfully they're all easy, somewhat easy fixes, and none of them cost a ton of money to to remedy. So, the first uh, and the most obvious that you can see from outside the car is that your headlight lenses, so the the clear plastic that is covering the outside of your headlight housing, could be dirty, or over time it could turn yellow or start to cloud up, which happens uh, quite frequently with cars that you know reach eight, ten, twelve, and so on years old. Yeah, over uh, time I've started to cloud up, for for example. <laughs> Exactly. My, my two-year-old pair of eyeglasses are now hard to see through as well. But uh, you can do a couple of things. So the most expensive thing would be to replace the headlight housing itself. So you can find those either online, your dealership, uh, anywhere pretty much that sells auto parts can order it for you. But the simpler fix for that is there are solutions that you can buy on Amazon or even probably through like Napa or AutoZone. Uh, it's a cleaning kit that has a solution and an abrasive that you're basically sanding off a layer of the the gunk that is built up on the outside of your headlight. Yeah, it's a very, very mild abrasive, right? It's not an abrasive that's going to dig in like a a heavy grit sandpaper. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And then it comes with the solution to polish it out and and clean it. So it should look pretty new after that. Now, if that's not the problem, you could have a a couple of other things going on. The first is that your bulbs could be aging and dying, which does happen just like the light bulb in your your living room uh, light fixture starts to dim and kind of yellow over time, that can happen with your headlight bulbs. So maybe it's time to look into changing your bulbs. You can do that yourself. The bulbs are not that expensive. You just have to handle them carefully. Uh, Although it's more difficult on some vehicles than others. So uh, you can check your owner's manual for that. But the other thing that could be happening is your headlights could have become misaligned. So over time, the bumps and bangs on the road, uh, you could knock your bulb out of aim. So it's, it's pointing off the side of the road or pointing way too high or too low. So it's not illuminating the road in front of you the way that it once did, which uh, could just lead you to believe that it's not working. So your headlight unit, you'll have to check your owner's owner's manual again, but usually there's a screw that can be turned to adjust it up and down and and left and right. So there are a few different causes, but like I said, thankfully, they're all pretty easy to diagnose and fix. Right. And it's one of those uh, things that many of us can still do uh, in our in our driveway versus a lot of mechanical fixes these days, which are beyond what we're, we're able to do because of specialized tools being needed, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. 
Well, in the next segment, we will be talking with a, uh, a big wig, actually. He's got a very large wig. His name is Tim Kaniskas. He is global head of Alfa Romeo and the North American head of passenger cars for uh, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. Uh, great guy, loves performance, loves to talk about performance, and I, I look forward to the conversation we're going to have with him. So stay with us for that, and uh, we'll be right back right here on America on the Road. I'm Jack Nerad, and with me is Chris Teague. We appreciate the fact you're with us. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack Nerad back with you, and we have a special guest with us, and I mean a special guest. Uh, this guy is... Uh, well, he's got a bunch of great titles and uh, just a, f- a bunch of fun things to deal with, a bunch of fun toys to deal with. His name is Tim Kaniskas. He is global head of Alfa Romeo. That's pretty great to start. But then he's also head of passenger cars at Dodge, SRT, Chrysler, and Fiat, uh, all for FCA. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for being with us. We do appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me on, Jack. I'll tell you, uh, July has been a great month for the Dodge brand. Uh, let's dive into that a little bit. You have had great announcements, uh, great results from J.D. Power. Uh, where do you want to start? Um, you know, let's start with J.D. Power because that one, I think, caught the world uh, by surprise. Uh, first time, 34 years, first domestic manufacturer ever to take first place in the J.D. Power Initial Quality Awards. Um, and we're we're super super proud of that. Yeah, and rightly so. I mean, that is a an award that goes back almost forty years. I, I happened to be at JD Power uh, back in the nineties and and spent some time uh, understanding how that award is done and how important it has been. Uh, and that's really kind of a benchmark award, isn't it? Uh, a landmark for you. It, it really is, and. What we like about it more than, well, I mean, we love the award, but what's really special about the award is it really ties in to what we're doing with the brand and where we're taking the brand and the positioning of the brand going forward. So I think the combination of having the first time award winning number one for the quality and then two, how it actually dovetails into what we're doing with the brand, I think is a really special moment for us Um, because when we won the award, you know, there's there's always going to be people out there that... Uh, you know, look at everything half full. We won the award. People said, well, yeah, you know, uh, they've been they've been building Chargers and Challengers and Durangos for, you know, quite a period of time. So they've had some practice. You know, OK, that, that, you always get that kind of stuff out there. But I, I come back at that and I say, no, it, OK, yeah, we haven't built in the cars for a little bit of while. So we have had some practice. So that definitely helps. But I will tell you, there's two bigger issues that tie into that and, and you know this there, there's no such thing as a car that's not complicated anymore i mean these cars are very complicated pieces of machinery um so our quality guys have been just laser focused on making sure that tweaking pushing pulling making sure that the best possible quality can come out of these plants so that's a huge testament to all the work that the engineering team and the quality team has done but i will tell you there's another thing in there that that really is kind of the hidden piece of the uh the third leg of the stool and that was the brand positioning if you look back for the last couple of years chargers and challengers and durangos have been doing well in initial quality they've never been number one they've never been top of the list but they've been doing well and we've been investing heavily in these cars but we haven't been investing in things like uh assisted driver technology and you know huge touch screens and things like that we've been investing in the things that the customers for these vehicles said they really wanted um, we could have spent those huge investments and we could have given them those technologies, but our customers said, no, I want higher performance. I want, I want higher performing suspensions. I want higher horsepower. I want to be able to have lower zero to 60 times and things like that. And that's where we've been pouring our money in. And that's what you saw in our, in our reveals that we had on July 2nd. And quite honestly, it's never easy, but it's maybe a little bit easier to tweak 100 horsepower than it is to try and get a vehicle to drive by itself. So so that weighs into the equation, too. And, and again, that's what our customer wants. They don't want the car to drive itself. They want it to be really fast. Yeah, and I, I, I really want to talk about that because I love performance and want to talk. But one thing I want to mention about IQS, and I, it really goes to uh, what you've been able to solve with things like infotainment systems and just overall controls. Uh, that's something that a lot of (laughs) global car companies have not solved nearly as well as Dodge has. And that figures in 
big time in those initial quality scores. Just being understandable and easy to use, and Uconnect is, I, I think, the best system in the house. It's just the best out there. Yeah, we we have the Uconnect system across uh, across the board on our cars. And matter of fact, um, the three cars that we launched on July second, the Durango. Um, is actually going to get the fifth generation of our Uconnect system, which is actually another leap forward in Uconnect. Uh, and we try to spend all of our time um, not with the glitz, but with the functionality and making it very user-friendly and making sure that it's easy for you to just jump in the car and it's intuitive and you can understand it and you can go. And I think that's what we're hearing back from our consumers and, and the people that are testing the product as well. Yeah, absolutely true. Well, let's dive into all those great announcements you made earlier in the month. Uh, really uh, impressive stuff and more horsepower than <laughs> you know, one could ever imagine. Uh, so talk a bit about that. Now, you, if you want to start with Durango, let's let's go there first. Yeah, sure. The first one uh, is Durango because Durango is actually more than a horsepower story. Sure, it, a lot of the headlines focus on the horsepower, but the Durango is actually a mid-cycle action on the car uh, and fairly dramatic. And what we did was I'll, I'll put it in two chunks. I'll say exterior and interior. Uh, on the exterior, it was really more evolutionary. We didn't completely tear up the exterior because the focus groups that we've had with our consumers, they like the shape, the look, the aggressive nature of the vehicle. Uh, and that aggressive nature of the appearance of the Durango kind of sets it apart from the rest of the pack. So much so that a lot of our consumers are really calling these vehicles their their three row chargers. They're really calling them. This is the muscle car that fits my lifestyle. I, I really wanted a Challenger, but I needed to tow my boat. I needed the third row for the kids, whatever. Um, so it, it kind of ties into that space. So what we did was we got even maybe a little bit more aggressive on the front end with a new fascia, new headlights. Is really, uh, really, I think a, a really strong change to the front end. But we left most of the, the sheet metal the same, changed the rear spoiler. The reason we changed the rear spoiler was not for looks. It was because we needed more downforce because we knew we were going to be adding so much more power. But where we really put the coals to this thing was on the interior. Um, and it was very similar to what we did back in 2015 on the Challenger. In 15 on the Challenger, we knew with the iconic shape of the Challenger, we really couldn't mess with that. So we didn't change the exterior, but we changed the interior a lot. And it had a dramatic effect in the marketplace. It's the same level of change in the Durango. Uh, and the pictures don't do it justice. I can't wait until these things are in dealerships and people can see them in person. Because we really took that philosophy of the customer saying, this is like a muscle car. And we put a muscle car interior in it. We completely changed the interior where the dash now actually um, moves over towards the driver like a sports car. So it's actually angled towards the driver, got a full TFT screen. Like I said, it's got the new Uconnect 5 system in it with a 10-inch uh, touchscreen. Uh, it's got a traditional muscle car T-shifter in it with a whole new console. It, it's just a totally different feel. If I, if I blindfold you and put you in the front seat of the Durango, you'd say, oh, I'm in a Challenger. Nope, you're in a full-size three-row UV. And I tell you, it's hard to find white space in the market, but I think probably Durango has found a little bit of white space. Uh, there's nothing really exactly like it out there, and certainly nothing like a, a Durango SRT Hellcat, uh, not even close. And I, I think that stands you in pretty good stead. You, you have comment on that? Yeah, we, we, like being, uh, we like being in the smaller areas. I, I don't want to be in a segment that may be three times the size, but has 27 competitors. I like being in a space where you only have a couple competitors and you can really stand apart and do something different because that's where you have an opportunity to really play towards who that customer is and what they're looking for. And, and honestly, in a very crowded marketplace today, um, that's what makes all the difference. And, and if you look at what we do with the performance on these vehicles, um, they look different than the other cars in the segment. And if you look at everything else in the segment, there there really isn't uh, a rear-wheel drive performance base, unless you get into the super high-end, you know, 200 premium cars. Uh, there really isn't a rear-wheel drive performance-based UV with this level of power. And even when you get into the mainstreams, nobody's selling V8s anymore. About a third of our vehicle sales in Durango are V8s. Um, and a lot of it goes back to towing. A lot of our customers buy for towing, where we put a lot of emphasis on that, where you can have our smaller package and out-tow the larger vehicles. It'll actually out-tow the tow class above this. So it'll out-tow a large SUV 
in this same package. So we actually have a tow rating of 8,700 pounds on this vehicle. That's a big boat, you can tell. Yeah, absolutely. It's a big boat. Well, why don't we segue? We're talking with Tim Kaniskas. He is the global head of uh, Alfa Romeo and head of passenger cars for Dodge, SRT, Chrysler, and Fiat. Um, let's talk a bit about Dodge Charger, I mean, uh, and Charger SRT in particular. Uh, just more of a good thing, I think, is what we're talking about here, huh? Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we stayed very true to our model. Um, we believe that we have, I'll start with the two door first. We believe that we have the car that really stands apart from this segment. There's, there's really five vehicles in the segment. There's Charger, Challenger, Camaro, Mustang, and Corvette. And a lot of people roll their eyes when I say Corvette, cause I lump Corvette with, with a muscle car and I don't lump it in with a muscle car. Cause I say it's the same. Um, I only lump it in there because we look at the customer shopping behaviors and the number one cross shop, um, to our SRT products is a Corvette. So, if a customer is going to cross shop it, I got to kind of lump it in there, even though I see it as giving completely different. So I'll put Corvette out on the side and say that's completely different. And then I'll take Camaro and Mustang. They're great cars. I would never say anything bad about them, but they're different than our car. Um, they're more track focused. Um, they're a little bit smaller than our car. That leaves our car on an island. Our car is what we believe is true to the original formula of being a muscle car, being bigger, heavier, a functional rear seat, a big trunk. I'd say more of the GT type of a car than a traditional track-focused vehicle. So it's a little bit more everyday usable, and that's why we also offer the only V6 all-wheel drive so that we can sell into um, you know, the Rust Belt where people need um, to have a vehicle that can go through the snow occasionally and not just have a, a car that they drive three or four times a month. Um, I think that gives us a very unique positioning there. And then, of course, you know, I, I say it all the time. This is the golden age of performance. So we need to keep pushing the envelope. No matter what happens, no matter what comes into the marketplace, no matter how technology changes, we got to keep pushing there. Uh, and we did that again on the Challenger this time. Uh, we stopped building the Demon. And when we stopped building the Demon, we wanted to make sure that we still had our claim as the quickest, fastest, and most powerful muscle car in the space. So we came out with the Superstock. The Superstock now on pump gas, regular pump gas, is 807 horsepower and we went to a proven formula we took the uh, traction enablers from the demon we took the 18 inch wheel and tire which is a little funny if you think about it if you're not really into performance cars people always see and think bigger wheels are better uh, we actually went the opposite way we went to an 18 inch wheel and we went to a drag reel the reason that we do that is we wanted that big sidewall we wanted that big tire contact patch and we wanted the sidewall of the tire to be nice and soft and wrinkly so that we could get maximum traction and that's exactly what we picked up the car runs now 1050s in bone stock trim we picked up three tenths of a second and three tenths of a second doesn't sound like a lot in a drag race that's three car lengths that is a long long lead in a drag race so uh we're excited about that package people are are, are pumped about it already already uh, putting in orders because it's a 20 model year not a 21 so that one is out and available right now as we speak uh and then the next one that we announced and the next one quite honestly there's no reason for it uh, there's no market research anywhere that tells you you should build a five passenger four-door family capable sedan that can run 203 miles an hour and have almost 800 horsepower no business case anywhere is going to tell you that that's needed but our customers are always asking us to keep pushing the envelope. So we put the, the red eye engine in the charger and uh, we think it's going to just be an amazing package. Yeah, I, there's no doubt about it. And uh, you say there's no business case. And I, I know in some ways uh, you might be being a little bit facetious because certainly all of these things that you're doing is what sets the Dodge brand apart. And there's value in that. Even if you're losing money on every one of those cars you sell, uh, if you have that halo uh, surrounding the entire brand, well, that's better than advertising, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was being facetious because yeah, I know you're recording this and I just want, didn't want one of our finance guys to come back and throw in my face someday. Uh, but no, it, it, it is all tied into exactly what we try to do. Uh, and if you look at our lineup, we made a decision about six years ago to really step away from what is considered to be the traditional um, path in our industry. In our industry, there, there's always been a, a philosophy of maybe a good, better, best. And if you stepped up to the best, most expensive vehicle, it was always, you know, the, the better looking car the, with the more features and the more benefits. And that's, that's just the way pretty much every consumer product works, right? 
um, we walked away from that and it was a dangerous decision to make, but we walked away from that a number of years ago. And we said, you know what, we want anybody that's interested in performance vehicles to be part of this thing and not feel like I bought something less than the other guy. And we now have a walk that goes from $30,000 on our muscle cars to over $90,000. So we got about a $65,000 walk on a vehicle that looks relatively the same. And, and in our industry, that's, that's a little bit risky. Yeah, I mean, in the industry, that's something that would basically never happen. You know, that price walk is just way too wide to uh, justify uh, from conventional thinking anyway, right? Yeah, because normally what you do on those walks is, you know, you this one gets the better quality leather. This one gets the real wood instead of the fake wood. And this one gets the bigger uh, screen and, and, it's, and its features, right? Um, you can't come up with enough features to spread $65,000. So what we decided was, we said, it doesn't matter what price point you're buying at. We want you to have the cool look and feel because we say that the attitude of the car is where the performance is. And then our price points are strictly on horsepower. How much money do you want to spend to go faster? So we start you out at 300 horsepower and we take you all the way up to 800. Well, and the price value is there throughout the line. I mean, for say 50K, for example, you can get a, a vehicle that performs way beyond uh, what most uh, luxuries are, are giving you for $100,000 or more. Yeah, and, and our consumers figure that out. We, we have a very strong, uh, very active consumer base. We have, we have 12 million followers uh, across our social platforms. And not only do we have 12 million, they're highly engaged. And these people aren't shy. I mean... <laughs> They post constantly, they email me, they tell me what they like, and, and they're not shy about telling me what they don't like. Um, that's good. They also can dig into our products and find the sweet spots, and, and they really have. Um, we have a car across Charger and Challenger that we call the Scat Pack. And to your point, it's 485 horsepower. It is in that high $40,000 range. And bang for the buck, there's nothing that can touch that car from performance, from a horsepower performance and content at that sweet spot price point. Right now, that thing is running for the 20 model year, about over 40% of our business. Yeah. Yeah. So the consumer really finds value and they, they understand what's out there. And, uh, and, and that's what you're providing, value in a particular way. Now, it's not value for everybody. Not everybody wants that level of performance. But for those who do, uh, at the kind of price points you're talking about, you're pretty much the only game in town these days. That, to me, is the ultimate goal, is that they buy into the brand and they buy into the lifestyle. And by the way, they also bought the product. Right. That, that is a sustainable business model. How would you characterize the Dodge brand? What would you tell people? What's your elevator pitch on that particular brand these, these days? <laughs> that's, uh, that's funny. Um, the most important thing that we say is it sounds like a marketing pitch, um, but we talk about the brotherhood of muscle. And I always have to be careful to tell everybody when I say brotherhood of muscle, it has nothing to do with, with gender. Brotherhood of muscle is all about a group of people that are brought together by an absolute love of performance and of muscle cars. And the other part of that equation is when I say their absolute love of performance and muscle cars, that has nothing to do with horsepower or zero to 60 time, because we distill that down then to say that performance is an attitude. It's a very attitudinal position on the car. It doesn't matter if you're driving a 300 horsepower uh, GT model, or if you're driving a red eye, you're all part of that brotherhood. You're all part of that family. And that really is the pitch. We want you to be part of the brotherhood. We want you to be part of something bigger than your purchase. We want you to be part of this resurgence of American muscle. Right. You're not driving an appliance. You're driving something that expresses yourself. And uh, if that's the expression you want, and a lot of people do, and <laughs> it has never gone away, uh, that's a good place to be, isn't it? Walk into Home Depot and you see a line of 30 washing machines and one of them's red. I want to be the red one. Right, right. What else should our listeners know about Dodge brand SRT uh, going forward? Um, going forward, we're going to stay on this strategy. And everybody talks about, you know, what's going to happen in the future? What about electrification? What about full battery electric vehicles? I embrace that change. I think that is going to be the best thing for our industry. I think not, this is not going to be 1971. 1971 performance died. 
this is not going to die. This is actually going to make it even bigger and better than it's ever been. Um, we will step into that future and we will use electrification and it will make these cars even better, more fuel efficient. Yeah, sure. But also way more performance. Um, you know, the benefits of electrification, electrification gives you instantaneous torque and it doesn't have to be full battery electric, full battery, battery electric is awesome, but it also can be enhanced by electrification in the form of hybrids and PHEVs and, and, uh, mild hybrids and things like that can overcome some of the inherent uh, disadvantages that come with an ICE engine. And and in some cases, uh, smaller displacement, lower displacement, maybe even turbocharged uh, engines that have uh, less low-end torque than a big 6.2-liter iron block supercharged V8. Yeah, that ability to plug in torque where you need it, when you need it, and instantaneously, that's a, a nice little uh, thing in the toolbox, isn't it? It, it really is. And I, th- I think it's going to be a very exciting time. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be like when the whole world all of a sudden one night nobody wanted fuel injection and then all of a sudden the next day you couldn't live without it. I think electrification, it, it, you're going to get to that same inflection point. And I think what's going to be really exciting about it is just like fuel injection was driven by um, emissions and then it became a performance tool, the same thing's going to happen with electrification. The mainstream market is going to adopt electrification out of pure need. And then once it adopts that, the price point, of that technology will come down. The cost per kilowatt will come down. The cost of the, the electric engines, motors will come down. And when that comes down in the mainstream because of the volume of the mainstream, then it allows you know the crazy side of the business, the performance guys, to then get that at a lower price point and go crazy with it. Right. And I think we're probably on the verge of that, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Well, terrific. Tim Kaniskas, thanks so much for being with us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, Fascinating stuff, and uh, you know, I congratulate you on all this performance stuff. Uh, it takes me back to my youth, uh, which is a nice place to go because it's a long way from, <laughs> from here. Uh, so thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. And that was our interview with Tim Kaniskas, who is the global head of Alfa Romeo and, of course, North American head of passenger cars for uh, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. So, uh, thanks to him for being with us. We really do appreciate it. And the stuff they're doing at Dodge is very exciting, and it's, uh, I'm glad to see that performance is still alive and well. Uh, I would also like to thank Chris Teague for co-hosting again so ably uh, this week. Thanks for being with us, Chris. Thank you for having me and for flattering me, but I will say that if anyone listening likes what you heard, you you like what we're doing here, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review so it helps us continue to grow and bump us up the charts a little bit. It would be very helpful. Right. And while we're just begging for help, uh, well, I don't know if we're begging exactly, but we're asking. Uh, I'd like to let you know that my most recent book, The GR Factor, is out there, available on Amazon and wherever you buy books. Uh, it's about the undeniable power of the golden rule, uh, something we apply, I think, as we do this show and uh, apply in our daily lives. And uh, if you're interested in, in that book, please look for it, uh, as I say, at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, other places where you can buy a book. And that's it for this edition of America on the Road. With Chris Teague, Jack Nierad with you, and we appreciate you being with us. Please join us again next time right here for another edition of America on the Road.